We are creatures of desire. What we most desire is meaning. What makes us suffer most is a lack of meaning. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Marital therapist, author, and communications trainer Andrew G. Marshall invites guests from all walks of life to discuss what makes life meaningful. Hello, I'm Andrew G. Marshall, and welcome to The Meaningful Life. Our topic today is daughters and fathers. What is the impact of the first man in a woman's life? What if he has been physically or emotionally missing or simply inadequate? And what about the other end of the scale being daddy's girl? What is the impact of the daughter's self-image and the type of man she marries or is attracted to? My guest is Jungian analyst and clinical psychologist Susan Schwartz, who's the author of The Absent Father Effect on Daughters, Father Desire and Father Wounds. She has a practice in Arizona, USA. So, Susan, what actually drew you to this particular topic? Well, over many years, because it is a big topic, it is also one that is not discussed that much in Jungian psychology. So I found that interesting, especially also because Jung himself had four daughters. So the daughter has been diminished and diminutive in many cultures and in many ways. But as well, many of the women who came to see me for analysis and therapy had very little to say about their fathers. And whatever they did say, they excused the father. So whether the father was absent, abusive, kind, not kind, good to the his partner, not good, good to her or not, she always would say, he did the best he could. And I questioned that. And let me guess, when it came to mothers, there was not quite so much excusing going on. That was part of the problem that I also felt, that the mother becomes the one blamed. You also classically, in psychoanalytic and psychotherapeutic thought, the mother is blamed because actually, She's been the one that's been present. And for centuries or generations, the father has been not there. So the daughter would not know the father. And therefore, anything that happened is at the cost to the mother. So what has your relationship been like with your father? Well, that is an interesting question. So I'm going to say, personally and generally, an answer to your question. I also experienced what many have had, which was thinking that the father was there. Thinking he was there when I was little, I made up stories. I excused. It was okay, knowing it wasn't. And over the years, I was able to examine internally myself And also with others, what did that really mean if he wasn't there? And I became quite involved with trying to figure out what stories had I told myself and what stories was I listening to? And how had I suffered and how have they suffered as a result? Well, let's pull that apart. So what stories were you telling yourself and what stories are your clients telling themselves? The stories are, one, that it's all right, he is excused. But the other story under it is what is the damage that is done, not just to who we choose as a partner, but how we treat ourselves. So if you're in a situation where father is not there doesn't look at you, the look is lecherous, you know, there can be all kinds of situations here. They all have a similar result, which is one does not learn to honor oneself. This is not an individual issue. It is also a cultural issue. Culturally in the United States, I'm sure in Great Britain and in many countries, and it's not really 
just a Western issue either. The daughters that I have worked with of many backgrounds, many ethnicities, say a very similar thing, which is they learned to not treat themselves well. And they learned to accept that that was all right because they're less. Psychologically, even though we see that not the same now and life is quite different, many people, many women, many daughters go along with being diminished. They don't ask for more. I'm sort of sitting here at this precise moment feeling a huge heaviness. I can feel people saying, please, Susan, don't pick up this stone. I don't think I really want you to go under it. (laughs) Well, you know, one of the reasons that I am speaking very heavily is that that is me as a person, but the topic is very heavy and it's loaded with unconsciousness equally. It is loaded with hope, promise, treatment, rectifying the situation, growth, development, being aware, listening to oneself, and going for all you want and didn't have. So even though it is a very heavy stone, once you remove the stone, well, look at what can grow. So I think that's really important that we're going to be lifting the stone. But I think before we lift the stone, let's understand the impact of the stone, so to speak. How does this actually show up on the ground, having an absent or inadequate father who doesn't really see you? It shows up in one's body, in one's psyche, in the people one chooses to relate to. It shows up in career. And all of these, the daughter will accept less. I'm sure if listeners kind of contemplate, where am I accepting less in my life? How do I treat my body? And I want to emphasize the physicality of the issue because fathers classically, unless they're abusive, are not oftentimes associated with women's poor body attention, and they are very contributory to it. In their absence, absence leaves a presence, a presence you can work with or a presence you can take in inside as I don't count. You describe it as having a hole in your heart. Can you amplify that for me? The hole in the heart is how one views oneself. Defeat can't do it, not able, settle for, you've done enough, why are you too much? A hole in the heart is actually painful. And that's why I use the phrase, because I wanted to emphasize the painfulness of what daughters have experienced. Again, not to be defeated, but to recognize that this has been a very serious issue. Because I think what is really important to explain to our listeners is something that even as adults, we still hold on to that starts right in our childhood, which is we are as we are treated. Let me explain what what I mean by we are as we are treated when we're children. So let's say we're five years old and we're sticking with fathers and father comes home and he just walks straight to the television and switches it on. Now, we as adults here now could perhaps think, well, he's had a really tough day at work. He needs to unwind before he can actually connect with the family. But the child hasn't got the imagination to be able to step into the father's shoes. And anyway, they don't understand about work. They don't understand about the nasty commute and the traffic on the motorway. So they see just that they are ignored. And why are they ignored? Well, there are two possibilities. Number one, that uh, they're not worth being noticed. Or number two, our father um, is not interested in us or is not available to care for us. And the second one is just too terrifying a possibility. So we go for the first one. And so if we are ignored, it's because we are not interesting or important. And as adults, we sort of can see the full picture of that tiny scene I've presented. But as children, we couldn't. 
Am I going in the right direction, Susan? I think you absolutely are. Let me add a bit of what actually I have just heard this week from several daughters in relation to their fathers. Your situation is sadly very typical. If you think about it, if we piece it apart, no words are said. There is no eye contact, so there's no father gaze. A child interprets something's the matter with me. I am flawed. So I either can't ask for very much, I'm not good enough, and that gets interpreted in many ways. I cannot interrupt father. I can't talk to him. He pushes her away. Another one said, well, can't wait until he dies because then he'll be out. I won't have to deal with this. And I said, he's living in your head. So this is also what happens in your scenario of when you're five. He lives in your head your entire life until you figure out, I'm not flawed. He doesn't have to live in my head. And I have a voice. I could come up to him and say, Daddy, you need to pay attention. Help me with my work. Read the book with me. Help me learn. Come to my soccer game. She learns to have a voice from realizing that she didn't. Let's go to basics. What is the job of a father then? Well, you know, that's something I have been wondering as well, because I don't want to divide up the mother's role or the mother figure role is this and the father is that. Ideally, he should, should, could carry nurturing, love, demonstrative, healthy affection, his own self as one who reflects, deals with his feelings, can express himself, and automatically realizes that a parent is a responsibility and a pleasure and an opportunity, and he will be there with, the with is important, he will be there with his daughter. He will not pawn her off onto the mother figure. So he will be active, participatory. He will honor her body, mind, and soul. And I agree with you. I don't think we should be parceling up, you know, jobs for men and jobs for women. But the experience of being a mother and an experience of being a father, I think, are going to be fundamentally different because the child has actually come out of your body. That is a different relationship from, I mean, obviously as part of you, but has not actually physically come out of your body. So the whole relationship often is going to be very different for that in that way. Yes, yes. On the other hand, as the baby comes out from the mother's womb, right away, shouldn't the father be there? Loving, holding, cherishing, being physical with the baby. Classically, and this is changing, but the sad thing is it's not changing fast enough, really, that the father would be there in his emotional total self. Now that means that a father will have examined his emotional total self. And for generations, they haven't done that as well as the history of psychoanalysis and psychology is predominantly of men who had difficulties with their own fathers. And if um, it's anything like my practice, a phrase that I hear time and time again is, you're going to have to help me with that. You know, what do I feel? How do I show those feelings? I mean, just today I had a couple where the woman was feeling really quite emotional. And I could sort of sense the man's emotions under the surface, but he put on his professional sort of kind of hat because the message that he had been given is if a man gets emotional, it's actually going to make the woman even more emotional. And somehow his job is to contain. And if your job is to contain, you never really begin to think about what your own emotions are. You're too busy containing or focusing on other people's emotions. Yes. And it's a way from deflecting from your own. Equally, many times fathers put onto their daughters 
their own emotions. So the daughter is to carry the emotion for the father. If you've read Virginia Woolf, she writes many times about how she sits across from her depressed father and realizes she has to make him happy. So I'm going to go back to your example. He is making an excuse to go away from the depth of his emotions, which probably are very not contained. And he's afraid of his own emotive ability. And that's exactly probably what is needed, not just for the partner, and not only for the daughter, but for himself, really. Exactly, exactly. We've talked a lot about the archetype of the absent father. There's another very strong idea in our culture, and that is of the daddy-daughter romance almost. What sort of impact does that have? I mention that in my book, but I mention it in a bit of a sarcastic way because I question, is it really a romance? And should the daughter be the lover? And is she loving daddy because he seems to protect her? But basically, the issue is he's going to have her stay a daughter. That's the romance. So two things. One is he will romance her as an equal partner, which sets up a disaster inside of her psyche as well as his. And also then he doesn't allow her, if she has to be daddy's girl and connected to him in that way, she can't leave. Psychologically, she won't be able to go. The woman that I referred to just a bit earlier, who was looking forward to the death of her father, also has trouble accessing her own strength, her own confidence because she's been kind of a mixture of a daddy's girl and go along with a routine which did not give her strength or the ability to be her. So what I often get reported by my female clients is that actually they have a a sort of, or they imagine they have a different relationship when they're small with their fathers and when they suddenly become, I don't know, 12, 13, and they suddenly discover that actually they have a bit of a voice of their own. So they go from being having a good relationship with their father to having an incredibly antagonistic relationship with their father. Is that a common thing for in your practice too, Susan? It is a common thing in all cultures. Basically, what happens is when the girl turns about 12 or 13, she has a body and she has the body of an emerging woman. woman. And it oftentimes sets up kind of a conflict inside of the father who can't manage his own sexual feelings, his own loving feelings his own feelings, they all get jammed up inside, projected onto this little girl. Not that he wants to, but he's too unconscious of his own feelings. And he, she is going to be having to push him away and he will also push her away because he's afraid of his own feelings and he's not managing them. So around 12 or 13, he should be encouraging the beauty of her being, her development, her strength. He can't do it. And it creates terrible dissension. And again, how does that daughter carry her own honoring of her body, mind, and soul? And it feels like her body is a battleground because, you know, it's you can't go out of the house wearing that. Exactly. Yes, but you see, it kind of lasts throughout all ages. You can't appear in that. What do you think you're asking for? It becomes her problem, not an entire issue. It becomes you shouldn't have worn such a revealing this, that, or another. And you got raped because you were asking for it. I'm, I'm extending that. But that is the extension of it. So let's imagine that somebody's sitting here and they're nodding along and they're saying, ah, and suddenly father has come from the background and we've stopped excusing. And at this precise moment, I have to say it's a little terrifying. So how do they start to process this material? It's probably why they come to our offices. Because as you said, 
It is terrifying. What is terrifying is the veil of illusion has fallen down and it becomes disillusion. And that isn't the end point. Just like the end point isn't to just be angry at father. It is to understand, unpeel the layers, get into your unconscious, remember your dreams. And also where you, you mentioned this earlier, how are you treating yourself the way your father treated you? And is this what you really want? So it's a matter of starting to question from terrifying what has just been accepted. I think you're also going to be looking at your relationship with other significant men as well at this precise point. You know, how does, how do, how do you look at your husband um, with, uh, with this sort of piece of knowledge that your relationship with your father has set up something that is big and needs to be thought about? Yes, but it also brings up how one is like the father one did not want to be like. And does the daughter, this is kind of complex, is the daughter in the relationship with the husband or the partner, is she reenacting the way the father was to her? So she's acting to the partner the way the father acted towards her. So you've effectively become your own father sort of idea in the way that you're treating other significant people. Exactly. And in the therapeutic realm, does the therapist become the father? It's interesting you, you're saying that because, you know, when I was reading your book, I was thinking, you know, actually with my male clients, I am perfectly happy to be a stand-in father figure. I mean, there's a huge need for father figures and somebody who's prepared to listen and not judge and um, particularly other men and accept them is incredibly necessary. And there's a huge craving for it. I even run workshops on the father wound for men. Uh -huh. But I actually feel when I read that, I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, this is obviously my unconscious material. A lot of my clients, my female clients, will be seeing me as a father figure, you know, that I will be becoming their father. And the bizarre thing is, I feel perfectly comfortable becoming the father for my male clients, mm -hmm. but I feel very uncomfortable about being the father for my female clients. Now, help me with that, Susan. Well, that has something to do with your psychology. So I, I don't know how much you want to talk about that. But let me also say that I too become the father, but not always the good father. I get lots of projections of the, you know, the, not absent. I'm not absent, but I get lots of other projections from women and men, just like you do, of the father. And I am actually so glad that that father walks through the door or through the computer and is apparently there. Whether he's good, whether he's not good, it gives us the opportunity to really understand what is going on. So why do you think I feel comfortable becoming a man's father and less comfortable about being a woman's father? Yeah, you know, I was just wondering the same thing. I would say, I don't know how... I don't mean to be intrusive, but yep. I don't know how comfortable you are then in the, you know, you could say the internal father-daughter story or what that, it might set up confusion inside. Well, I think it might be something to do with, obviously, I don't have a daughter and I'm not a daughter. I did have a sister and obviously I suppose I would have seen the daughter-sister relationship. But I mean, my my father was, I tell you what, why don't I do a dream? Because weirdly enough, though probably not weirdly enough, my unconscious was working overtime. I knew I was coming to meet Susan today. Last night, I had a dream that involves my father. So, you know, I got up and I wrote it down. It's a slightly embarrassing dream, but uh, I'm sure Susan's heard far worse than this. So just a bit of background. Um, my father died about six months ago. My mother died about five years previously. Mm. So my father and my mother are both dying and they want to be naked in the bathroom in the bath. And they want to talk to me and my grandmother, who obviously died many, many years ago. This is my father's mother. They want to talk to both of us. Now, she does not want to intrude in this conversation. She doesn't want, I imagine, to 
be in the bathroom with them both naked. So she is dressed and she was born in 1898 or something like that. So, you know, we've got quite a a formal sort of kind of uh, dress and everything. So we go to my bedroom. I tell her that this is what my parents want. And my father is used to being naked because of all his years of playing rugby. And then suddenly the scene shifts and the information is we need two new washing machines and they're going to cost one and a half million pounds. So these are very expensive washing machines. I mean, there seems to be a link between them being in the bathroom, about to get into a bath and these washing machines. So so let me ask you, why would it be that you would be in the bathroom? No, I'm I'm outside the bathroom, sorry. Oh, you're outside the bathroom and they are naked together in the bath. Yes. Oh, they're about to get in the bath. They want me and my grandmother to come in. And they, for some reason, this is sort of almost like not quite the deathbed conversation, but let's call it the bed death conversation. And for some reason, they want to do this naked. So uh, I'm about to honour that, but they want to speak to me and my grandmother. And my grandmother is less comfortable with this idea. My parents were regularly naked. They were both sportswomen um, and sportsmen. They thought it was perfectly acceptable and was good for us not to be conscious of our bodies, that they weren't things to be hidden away. Personally, I don't see it as anything sexual. I'm seeing it much more as naked in the sense of vulnerable and honest. So as you were talking about it, it's always interesting because your personal associations have taken it away from this kind of the wrong nakedness. The other thing is that there's a transgenerational issue, double cleaning. So the bath is one cleaning and the very expensive washing machines are cleaning again. So there's a lot of cleaning, maybe cleaning up through the generations. And you are supposed to witness this. You're supposed to be a part of it because you're the third generation then. And it will cost a lot of money. So a million Mm. and a half is a great deal of money. There is another thing, which is, I mean, it's always interesting kind of what we associate with as therapists. But Jung has a series of pictures from the Middle Ages. He puts in the psychology of the transference. And in it, the two, the man and the woman, are together in the bath. And it represents transformation, it represents change, it represents honesty, it represents truth, it represents nakedness for sure. It's like, this is the deal. There's nothing to hide. And in your dream, somehow it is like to show there's nothing to hide or there is also a massive cleaning going on. And it might be related to your father who has just died, your mother didn't die that long ago, you're to clean some things up because you're still alive. Yes. I mean, in a sense, that is my role in life, isn't it? I listen, I help people do their laundry, really. That's part of of being being a therapist. Not that either of them would have wanted to have talked about anything remotely emotional, but I'm the one who's going to listen. My sister isn't there. My grandmother is sort of ambivalent about being there. But also, perhaps, if we're, we're using you as the example, perhaps you are to carry on a different role of the masculine and a different way of being the father. Because what you said is that your parents were all right walking around and being naked, but not with their emotions, with their bodies, not their emotions. Yeah, they've got that exactly right. Yeah, and grandmother was the Victorian era, Freud, et cetera, the beginning. Not exactly open with emotion, but a beginning in a certain way, you could say. And so it's up to you. You're the one that's going to carry on how to be more open with emotions. And actually, that would be a father figure, whether you're as a therapist in your own personal life or whatever, that would really change the absence into presence. Because if you think about it as well, I wrote about this in the book, that the space of absence means something to fill. So what you're saying is there was absence emotionally. 
So, I mean, I'm not saying black and white, but absence emotionally. And you're the one to fill it. And you're willing to put out a lot of money to do that. <laughs> I wish I had a, a million and a half to buy those washing machines. Well, you know what? It's the metaphor of the money is the energy. It, will, yes. it takes a lot of energy to change all that generational repression, you could say. And how right you are. So this is, a, I suppose, a very good example of how dreams can actually help you move something along. But those are not the only ways of moving things along. So how can people begin to fill that farther hole? And I'm thinking of the sort of things that people can can do not necessarily with a therapist, but they can actually start to think about themselves, sort of practical, everyday things they can do to start filling that hole. Well, I, you mentioned it earlier, examining relationships and also, quite honestly, sitting down with one's partner, also friends, and really exposing the emotion and the pain and the joy and the upset and the conundrum of how to get through being very honest about it. And also people take, they have journals. They ask people, so what do you think? Do you think that I'm this way or that? It's a self-examination. I also find that when you're in a problem with yourself, it's such a perfect time to examine yourself because you can't get away from yourself. You have to face yourself in the mirror. There's too much pain to do it and too much pain to not do it. So you might as well do it. And it will take a certain discipline of self-focus, intent, and the encouragement to do it. Culturally, that isn't as prevalent as it might be. But if you have friends and support system and people who really love you deeply, they will help get through the difficulty. I think one needs the difficulties to start to examine presence and absence and what you really wish for and to get it. It's that focus really every day. Every you day? Know, you can take a walk. <laughs> well, well, let me say this. You can take a walk, you can take a run, and you can intent about yourself. How do you feel? What is going on? What are you backing away from? What needs cleaning? Where are you unconscious of yourself? Asking the questions mm. helps open the doors. You don't have to find answers, but opening the doors. You could ask a question every day. So, you know, let me try and think of an, a question you could possibly ask. Why did my father never come to see me play football? Exactly. And also, what did I wish I would be able to have said to my father? What would I wish he would have said to me? And how will I put that wish into my life now? How will I get it answered? Even if he is dead or he's gone or you don't ever know who he was, the ability to imagine also opens doors. Okay, let's stay with the fact that at this precise moment we can't speak to him. So almost ask him a question. So you write a question like it is, you know, why did you never come to my football match? You know, why did you not come to this? Why did you not come to that? So, you know, why didn't you come to my school sort of kind of thing? Yes. And then you imagine actually answering it as him. Yes. So, you know, and if he ans if he gives bullshit answers, write the bullshit answers down. You know, it might be that once he's actually given you a, the jaw, 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 he might give you something a bit more honest. But, um, you know, see, give him space and time, see what he has to say. Yes. Jung calls this active imagination. So it's like, you you know, you drop your realistic focus and you allow yourself to imagine and access inside whatever comes up. It's like watching the unconscious without judgment doesn't have to fit here, doesn't have to fit there. But there will be things that you will learn about yourself. 
And it's very powerful to allow oneself to do it. And you have spent, imagining that your father was in the same house as you when you were growing up for chunks of time, you will have witnessed lots and lots of information that you would have taken in unconsciously. You'll have a lot of this stuff. You'll have overheard conversations. You'll have a lot of material. So you're not making it up. It's actually coming from what you've observed and what you've learned and what you've experienced over all this time. Yes, but let me also include in that many people don't even know their fathers. They didn't have a step anybody or no one came forward. So they have quite a blank in that area, really absent. However, that doesn't mean they can't imagine what they would have wanted. And you probably had an imaginary father, not in a sort of a concrete kind of way, but you would have had some fantasy about what he would be like. Exactly. So, and actually speaking to that fantasy is going to tell you a lot about yourself as well. It, it totally will. There is also this wonderful thing about our psyches, which is that the absent figures are actually there anyway, because we're kind of born with that chip of desire for the father or for the mother. So the absent people are there anyway? Yes, yes. And I think that's really worth just sitting on and just explain more about how they are really there. Well, if you think about it, even physiologically, we are born egg and sperm. So we have got all these cells inside of us that are a combination and all these mysteries that we don't know anything about, but we do know they're, they're hanging out in the unconscious. So all of these things that we are talking about are accessing the unconscious and things that are just always there. You know, it's like people who don't have a father and they might dream of a father. That's not their father, but it is the image that they might be carrying of a father. So the whole process is innate and accessing what's already there. So what if your father is still alive and, you know, you're going home to see him this weekend? <laughs> what do you do? Well, so let me say, what if somebody says, well, I heard this podcast and I think I'm going to ask my father some questions that I never asked. And I'm going to tell him how I have really felt about him in my life. I'm not going to do it perfectly. I don't have to spend hours and hours. I'm going to make a start. And I'm going to try to change things. And I'm going to see what happens. Now, it might not turn out the way you want it. But it's a how to make things different. And it's an experiment with oneself. It takes courage. And if you want a good opening question to ask your father that will get you information, and you might not even ever have asked this question, tell me about your father. Because him talking about his father will tell you an awful lot about him, and the, it's going to throw a new light on the kind of fathering he's given you as well. And it's a quite a neutral sort of kind of question. You know, it's a good opener because it's rather difficult to come out with, you know, hello, Dad, we haven't spoken for the last 30 years, but let me sit down and tell you what I'm thinking. But you know, even what you said, we haven't spoken for the last 30 years. I've really spoken. You know, we've spoken about the golf and the daffodils, but we haven't really spoken. Yeah. And so I'm feeling like I would like to really know you. How could we sit together and really know each other. And so can I ask you some questions and why don't you ask me some as well? Oh, Susan, that's just so beautiful. Thank you for that. That's really beautiful. And I'm sensing that you're sensing the beauty of the moment too. I think the beauty is opening communication. I also think we want to be a bit cautionary. There are some people who can not open. And they shouldn't, actually. They won't get anywhere. So they will have to open in other ways. So that's realistic. But why not try anyway? Yeah, I want to know you better. 
is a good neutral question. And exactly. if they don't want to take up the offer, then that's their loss. Yes, yes exactly. The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. Please follow us on Twitter, like us on Facebook, and visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material and other benefits. Let me tell you about my Substack newsletter. I'd love my Meaningful Life listeners to subscribe. The letter is a mix of relationship advice and my thoughts about building a meaningful life. I'm hoping that, that as it grows, it becomes a shared space, somewhere you can tell me about your thoughts and suggest ideas for new podcast episodes. You can find it at the Meaningful Life dot substack dot com. So please do sign up. Details will also be in the show notes, as will be, of course, details of Susan's book. If you go to my website, you'll find about details about how to send in a letter to us. And I've got a letter that we're going to discuss. And here it is. I'm facing a trial separation that my wife has asked for. It was a big shock to hear that she wasn't in love anymore even though I knew the relationship had problems. My anxiety issues, her depression, codependent behaviours, and reduced intimacy. I did all the wrong things at the first, like begging, but she said there was no other way. She has said it's not just the relationship. There are other factors, such as a potential loss of a parent involved, and perhaps a midlife crisis, and she needs space. I initiated counselling, which has sparked pain, but has also provided a lot of honesty and open communication. Basically, she feels a lot of guilt about not being good enough as a daughter and as a wife. She wants to try living on her own without responsibilities. Last week, she admitted to being confused about whether or not to leave, but the next day she said she definitely wanted to have the separation and has a place to rent. She's not moved out yet, so we're still living together and sharing a bed. There was some touching and hugging and crying, and I've tried not to be clingy. Very difficult, as I've realised I have abandonment, separation issues, with the anxiety, currently seeking my own help for this. My wife said she knew it would hit me, but didn't realise it would be so hard, and had expected anger and to be kicked out. My question, how best to deal with the limbo state over the next few days, weeks and months? Susan, what are your thoughts? Well, I have quite a few, as you were reading. Obviously, the communication between the two has been lacking for quite a while. And I would wonder, seeing as how this is about fathers and daughters, if they have ever really shared how they feel, both of them, about their fathers. And as you mentioned, why does she not feel good enough as a daughter? Has he asked her? And there is something also about limbo, because we didn't use that word in our discussion, but the whole process of finding out about yourself means you are in limbo. You're Mm. in a state of unease, not always, and anxiety. And can you sit with the unknown? It is a very hard place because you don't know what will happen. But the fantasy is that we think we do know what will happen. Everything is out of control here, but maybe it needs to fall apart to come together in another way. The separation is from the old way that they are relating to something different. It sounds choked up. It sounds not loving, as I said. It doesn't sound very free. And they both need to figure out what has gotten in the way of us being able to emote and be very honest with each other. Equally, I'm going to go back to your dream. I don't know if they have been in the bath together enough. Metaphorically, have they sat together in the water naked emotionally? It seems to be what's needed. And actually, although we're obviously here about fathers, we do mother, you can do mothers as well and grandparents and everything. My suspicion is that when they talk, they talk about their relationship all the time. And that is 
emotionally wearing and can make you defensive rather than naked. But actually talking about, you know, why don't you feel a good daughter? You know, there's going to be a lot of emotional material coming up there, you know, that there is an invitation to be naked. And, you know, I'll be equally naked because I will talk to you about my relationship with my mother and my relationship with my father. And this is all relevant material, but we're not actually sort of grinding against each other almost. Um, I, and I, mean, I mean that not in a sexual sense of sort of the friction between us. Yes, but I think that you're right. The grinding is sexual and emotional. And also, if you're going to have anything creative happening, you have to have tension. And when you said about them talking with each other, my thought was that they talked not about their relationship, which people can say they talk about their relationship, but it doesn't go very deep, that they just talked about the day, how the day was, which ultimately doesn't say at all what is going on. And I think that they've both been shortchanging themselves from going deeper. This crisis might help them to be able both to go deeper. And what I think you also said that I want to lift up, which I think is really important, is the problem is not the unknown, but actually their fantasies or their assertions of how it's going to turn out. So we, most of us can deal with the unknown. What we can't deal with is our panic. Oh my God, I'm going to be stuck here forever. Or, you know, I'm going to be cast out into the darkness. We don't know that. What we do know is can we cope with the unknown right here, right now? And the answer to that is normally we can cope with the unknown right here, right now. Except as we, I, I think you're right, but also if you look at all the fairy tales, legends, etc., the unknown is there almost from the beginning when the prince or the princess or whoever has to go out into the forest to another land, doesn't know where the magic comb is, where the this is, where that is. And that's that limbo that he's talking about. And can we stay on the road? Do we have the fortitude to stay on the road? We won't know the result. We won't know the next step. But if we stay there, something will happen. On the road, they nearly always meet, you know, a talking donkey or a, yes. or an old woman or a man with one leg or, you know, a giant or something like that. And sort of in life, I mean, not that we meet talking donkeys, but these random things happen that open up whole new things like, you know, uh, listening to this podcast, for example. That is true. And one of those figures might be that we fall into or don't realize are around. People start therapy or analysis. They say, I need to. They say, I'm in too much pain. I'm upset. I don't know what you're like, but I want to explore myself with another. So as therapists, we might be like the talking donkey or the whatever <laughs> that really helps because together something changes. That's how it changes in the togetherness, the openness. So how are you doing with the hole in your heart in relationship to your father, who I imagine obviously is no longer physically here, but still very much emotionally here? How am I doing personally? Mm. Yeah. Well, I wrote the book. <laughs> yeah. And how did writing the book change you? So I'm going to expand it again, that anything creative helps fill the hole in one's heart. You don't get a redo of a father, but you do get a redo of yourself. And you get to uncover your capabilities. You realize that you're the one who can do it, not alone, but alone. Because, I mean, life is not alone but one has to do it alone. And you realize what you're made of, that you, you're opening yourself to something else. And that fills the hole in one's heart. You start to realize, oh, this is who I am. This is who I am. These are my qualities. And I will do it. So thank you for being my witness on The Meaningful Life today and uh, being a talking donkey with me. Um, <laughs> 
I've got to uh, turn the question to you. Um, what makes your life meaningful? Well, my life is meaningful if I get to share of myself and am in connection with others. And if I keep on uncovering what I don't know, to me, it's like opening a really quite difficult book, staying with it. I'm just trying to understand, knowing I don't. It's that on the road process makes it meaningful. Having access, I think, to the unknown and unconscious and also to others makes it meaningful. Oh, thank you very much, Susan, for being with me today. The conversation, unfortunately, has to end here, but not if you are a supporter of The Meaningful Life. You can actually subscribe to us through my website. I'll be giving the details about that in a moment. If you're an Apple subscriber, you'll find there's a button that you can subscribe to the bonus material. And also through Spotify, you can directly do that. In the bonus material, Susan's going to be telling me three things she knows deep down to be true. And I'm going to be taking her through five different kinds of fathers. And we're going to actually look at um, how they might impact on a, on a daughter. So if you'd like to hear the rest of the conversation, here comes the details. You've been listening to The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall. You can follow Andrew on Twitter, like him on Facebook, and please leave a review wherever you consume your podcasts. Making, editing, and distributing The Meaningful Life comes with substantial costs, and we'd like to ask for your help. Visit our website, andrewgmarshall.com forward slash podcast, where you can join our supporters club and unlock bonus material for every program, send in a letter to be discussed by Andrew and his guests, and join a community of other people seeking to make their life meaningful. At the gold level, you get even more benefits. Production of The Meaningful Life with Andrew G. Marshall is by Michael Dooney. Social media by Madeleine Healy. Sound engineering and theme tune by Sebastian de la Luz Mendoza. And I'm Susie Colick. Please tell your friends and spread the word. Thank you.